Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Yes, we are live. Okay, uh, so today, uh, in the next half an hour or so, I'm going to be covering the management of diabetes during pregnancy. And uh, you know that uh, we are especially interested in diabetes in pregnancy because here we are not only dealing with managing one life, but we are managing two lives. And the impact of what is going on during pregnancy is transgenerational and will, some of the effects will be passed on to the baby. So um, the way I'm going to go about it is in six segments, starting with a brief introduction, the care of the patient in the preconception period, medical nutrition therapy and lifestyle and diet changes, and uh, management of gestational diabetes mellitus, management of pre-existing type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and intrapartum and postpartum care I will touch upon briefly. So effects of pregnancy on glucose homeostasis. We need to know this uh, because if you know what's going on in the body, you are in a better position to uh, deal with it and understand it. So pregnancy is a state which is accompanied by insulin resistance. And that means that if you haven't decompensated before you were pregnant, given this additional stress of pregnancy, which cause kicks in all the features that cause insulin resistance, that will unmask a, a tendency to diabetes. So um, uh, what happens? The, the, this, this insulin resistance is most prominent in the third trimester. And this is the reason why you do your, historically do your OGTT in the, between 24 to 28 weeks, because that's when it's going to be unmasked most. But that situation has changed and I will just touch upon it in a, a briefly. Um, and these changes that happen are actually due to the, uh, so that we can, uh, 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 to ensure the physiological changes are there to ensure the supply of nutrients to the baby. Um, this insulin resistance is mainly due to the placental secretion of diabetogenic hormones. So there's increased secretion of growth hormone from the placenta, corticotrophin releasing hormone, placental lactogen, prolactin, and progesterone. And all of these give the, the patient insulin resistance and a diabetogenic tendency. So who are the people at risk of gestational diabetes? We need to know what this risk category is. And you need to maybe in your antenatal clinic, so when you're seeing a preg pregnant patient, have these ready uh, up somewhere on a notice board so that you can refer to it quickly. So a BMI of more than 23 uh, kilograms, this is majority of our patients actually, an age of more than 25 years. Again, so if you look at these you know, most people, uh, women, pregnant women are at risk. If there are first degree relatives with diabetes, that's a risk factor, a history of delivering a large baby, we all know that, or a bad obstetric history of some sort. Previous history of gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy, or an HbA1c of more than 5.7, which is actually impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose, any of those in the previous period during pregnancy or an intercurrent illness are all risk factors. A previous history of, uh, sorry, if the, if the patient is very sedentary and not exercising or doing anything much, then they're also at risk. And there are other factors like a family history of diabetes and in South Asians in particular. So remember, we are a risk population. So, uh, you know, and that is why the recommendations have changed. So if you have hypertension additionally, if, the, if there is diabetic kind of dyslipidemia, so a low HDL and a high triglyceride, a history of polycystic ovary and acanthosis nigricans or a history of cardiovascular disease. Timing of screening. So now it is the first antenatal visit. And the reason why this is first antenatal visit is because we have so many of those risk factors. And we are now seeing our type 2 diabetes younger and younger and younger. So if you're going to do your OGT in first time in 24 to 28 weeks, this patient may well have lived with diabetes for all the antenatal visits for which she has been coming here, coming to you. So the first antenatal visit, and uh, if uh, and they say you should do an OGTT. So here's a little caveat here. 
um, we tend to do a fasting glucose because when we do a fasting glucose and if that is high, you don't need to put the patient through an OGTT. So uh, that saves, uh, you know, a lot of inconvenience to the patient, but you can do a fasting blood glucose or an OGTT. And then you do a second OGTT in, if that was normal, then you still do a second one at 24 to 28 weeks. Uh, if the initial one was normal, but if the initial one was abnormal, you don't need to the sec do the second one. So how is GDM uh, defined now? According to American Diabetes Association and CEFES, CEFES is the South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, and we are part of that society. And there's been a lot of work in this area by this society, and together they have come up with very uh, uh, concrete guidelines for management of diabetes during pregnancy. So any degree of glucose intolerance with onset, onset or first recognition during pregnancy can be termed as GDM. Previously, we had a lot of complex subcategories and all that, but now we have to label anything, any sugar abnormality during pregnancy is just plain and simple GDM or whether or not it exists after pregnancy. The SAFIS diagnostic criteria are the same as American Diabetes Association criteria. So simply speaking, a fasting glucose of more than 90, 92, one hour of more than 180, and two hour of one fifth, more than 153. This is GDM. Any one abnormal value makes a GDM. This is the IADPSG International Organization and WHO criteria. And if you look at the numbers here, they're giving you a range. I don't know why they're giving you a range, but the, the lower numbers are all the same as say fees. Yes, please go ahead. No, so that's the new thing. Any one abnormal sugar, one of these three is GDM. So different countries, different regions are different using a different criteria, but I'm telling you what the Society of Endocrinologists in this region has decided, and so has ADA. One abnormal test is GDM. And then there are NICE criteria, which are much more relaxed as compared to the other uh, 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 criteria. Okay, so fasting sugar of equal to a more than 100 and a two hour sugar of equal to a more than 140. So let me share with you another thing because ye aksar confusion cause karti hai. Ye jo maine aapko numbers di hai, these are numbers for control. These are targets for control, not diagnostic numbers. Di diagnostic numbers are different. But when you're managing these patients, then you want a fasting sugar to be less than 90, 90 or 92. You want the, two, uh, the one hour sugar to be less than 140 and you want the two hour sugar to be less than 120. So those are the targets that we have to uh, think about. Why are we worried about GDM? So like I said, it's not a question of one life, it's a question of two lives actually. There are maternal consequences and there are fetal consequences. What are the maternal consequences? So preeclampsia is much more common. I'm sure the obstetricians here know about it. The, uh, the, uh, the rate of cesarean section delivery is higher in these patients with all its attendant complications. And there is, of course, anyone who gets GDM during pregnancy is likely to develop diabetes. 50% 50, 50 of these women will have frank diabetes five to 10 years later. So there's a very high risk of developing type two diabetes after the pregnancy. And that that's why this is a window of opportunity to educate them, counsel them, do everything that is needed to prevent the onset of type two diabetes outside of pregnancy later on. What about the baby? So there is fetal macrosomia, the large baby we all know, intrauterine fetal death. This is a dreaded complication, which uh, you know uh, occurs from time to time and very, very disturbing. Shoulder dystocia because of the last baby, large baby birth injuries again for the same reason. Hyperbilirubinemia, polycythemia, neonatal hypoglycemia. So the high sugar in the mother leads to stimulation of the fetal, fetal pancreas as well, and uh, you know baby has high insulin levels. Respiratory distress syndrome, there was a, it's very interesting. We always talk about it, but when I was 
kind of reading for this lecture, I found out that the more recent studies with respiratory distress syndrome actually say that this is not as high as we used to think it is in babies of mothers with diabetes, because uh, after the advent of the dose of high dose steroid, that pre-delivery pre that is given, the respiratory distress syndrome seems to have leveled out to a kind of level that you have in non in patients with the, without diabetes. But, you know, it's not like 100%, but it, there is an impression that the respiratory distress syndrome is, is so much better after that steroid dose. And the transgenerational effect that I talked about, it is related, if, you, if the mother has GDM, the baby is going to be fatter. So the, the baby key metabolic script develop over a year that is kind of interfered with. And the baby can have in glucose intolerance and in uh, uh, adolescence and childhood. This is a very interesting um, uh, histogram. And I want you to see this, particularly the obstetricians, particularly us, the diabetologists. If you look at this, the blue color denotes minor anomalies in the baby, major anomalies in orange, and any anomaly is gray. And if you see that across the spectrum of HbA1c, the, the bar just keeps rising. So even when you have an HbA1c of less than 7.4, equal to or less than 7.4, but not normal, you have the uh, any anomaly of about 10% risk in the baby. Uh, but it is considerably much lower and ma any, a major anomaly is about over 7%. But as the HbA1c rises, you can see that with the 9.4 and 7.4 HbA1c, a quarter of the babies will have uh, some anomaly and about 20% will have uh, a major anomaly. And when you shift to, you know, more than 11.5%, you have, you know, almost a little less than 50% of the babies will have some anomaly. Uh, and uh, a quarter or more than a quarter will have a major anomaly. So this is the reason why diabetes has to be controlled before the woman gets pregnant because your rates of anomaly are so high. So when pregnancy is being planned, whether or not a patient has diabetes pre-existing or the patient has some of the risk factors. So risk factor evalu evaluation is very important. Uh, preconception counseling. Um, so the uh, should be incorporated into routine diabetes care. So if the woman is known to have diabetes, whether it's type one or type two, before they're getting married, there should be counseling about diabetes. Once they're get, getting married, they're planning to have a baby, they should be taken through that process safely. So they should be told about effective contraception and they should be told, uh, um, you know, methods that are, uh, you know, good and safe. And what you need to aim at is an HbA1c of less than 6.5. So this is for people who are known to have diabetes. And for people who have the risk factors, you have to know, find out whether or not they have diabetes before that. So um, HbA1c, other uh, ADS has six point, uh, less than 6.5, but HB, HbA1c of less than seven or closer to six or 6.5, uh, whichever is safely achievable, this is a SAFIS uh, guideline. And SAFIS is saying that because, you know, we are, uh, the other thing we have to remember is that genetically, we are a very fragile population. We tend to suffer from complications of diabetes at a much younger age, young, uh, at a lower level of HbA1c and also at a lower level of obesity. So this is why the, the targets are a little um, uh, stringent. And of course, when you control diabetes better, there are congenital anomalies that I've talked about. Uh, they are reduced, preeclampsia is reduced, and macrosomia and other uh, complications are reduced. So in, in case of uh, preconception care, if there is type 1 or pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes, poor control of diabetes has effects on the mother and baby, and there can be all sorts of uh, problems with development. And... There is the other thing that we are worried about from the point of view of the mother is the, uh, the eye complication. So we need to have screening for that eye complication. When should, this is pre-existing diabetes, mind you, type one, and because it can get worse during pregnancy. So before pregnancy or in the first trimester, if it hasn't been done already, then every trimester, it depends on what the eye is showing. If the eye is clean and there's nothing there, you don't need to do this more frequently. But if you have 
you know, moderate to severe retinopathy, then every trimester and then one year postpartum. And of course, frequency will be dictated by the amount of uh, retinopathy. And because retinopathy and nephropathy tend to go together. So if you see the uh, retinopathy, you need to make sure you screen for nephropathy as well with the uh, creatinine clearance and uh, proteinuria. So once we get to this GDM now, there is uh, this quintet management model where maternal edu education is right in the center of everything. This mother needs to be educated. So health literacy about her diabetes, about her weight, about her um, what she's going to eat, her exercise, and you know issues about what can happen to the baby, and you know motivate her, not scare her, but inform her and in, a, in an encouraging manner, and make sure that you know she understands. And of course, about what are the therapeutic options and what needs to be done. So in the dietary counseling, uh, in medical nutrition. Nutritional plan needs to be developed between the uh, between the patient and the dietitian, and there's no optimal caloric intake specified for pregnant women. So you can't say you're pregnant and therefore you take so many calories. Different things work for different patients, and you know each patient has to be evaluated separately. So you need to have adequate calories to promote fetal, neonatal, and maternal health. All of them you need to achieve your glycemic goals. So your calories have to be consumed in quantities and distributed in macronutrients in a manner that you get to the targets. And we've, we've shared the target numbers with you. Promote appropriate gestational weight gain so the baby is doing well and you, you don't starve the patient because if you starve this patient, then it's very easy to be ketotic during pregnancy. So here are some guidelines. This is dietary reference. Uh, uh, I forget what the I was. I is for index, yeah. Dietary reference index. So these are just normal healthy people. And these are some broad guidelines that how much uh, you know of what should be given. So they recommend that 175 gram of minimum carbohydrate uh, should be given, but you give it in a manner that you don't have post meal excursions of uh, hyperglycemia. And you give at least 71 grams of protein and, and at least 28 grams of fiber. And the rest you can uh, of the calories can be distributed in fat. Uh, these are general guidelines for healthy people. Of course, they have to be adjusted with what the weight of the patient is and how much calories you really want to give them. So the good news is that 70 to 85% of gestational diabetes can be controlled with medical nutrition therapy and counseling and lifestyle exercise and so on. So uh, this is what we should work on very vigorously because a, a lot of your patients will just be controlled with this. Um, a minimum of 1800 calories per day is recommended. Uh, this is again a more broad general guideline because you know, weight for weight and everything, this is what we feel that there are complex calculations that dietitians can do using formulas, using height, weight, activity level and so on. But if you broadly remember 1800 calories BM, for the mother's BMR, calories for physical activity, growth of the baby, and you know, for extra weight uh, of the mother, it may even have to be reduced in some cases. So I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but these are SAFE's guidelines. And they are kind of recommending how many calories according to the BMI of the patient. So if you ha have a normal weight, then you can have uh, a little less calories in the first trimester. And thereafter, you have a little more calories because the baby is growing and the needs are more. But if you're obese, then of course, you need to take less calories throughout pregnancy. So you can't eat for two and keep getting fat and say, I'm pregnant and you know, I have to let go. So what are the recommended weight gains? Again, I'm not going to go through this table, but there is, this is a SAFE's recommendation as well. This is our region, our kind of women. So these are tables that, you know, you need to take and you need to maybe put up wherever you're working so that you can quickly refer and give your patient some targets about what their weight gain should be. And so that they can also watch what they're um, is doing. This is an ADA recommendation. So American women, big bodies, big weights, bigger than us. So, but they say that in an overweight woman during pregnancy, seven to 11 kilograms should be uh, gained. 
And in an obese woman, it should be 4.5 to 9 kilograms. So a maximum of 9 kilograms of weight for American women. For, um, uh, for us, again, they, for, for even more than 27, in a singleton pregnancy, they are, the maximum that they're saying is 9 kilograms. So, you know, broadly, just remember that, that even in an obese patient, you can, uh, that's the maximum they should gain, 9 kilograms. And in a patient with normal weight, you know, up to a, even 18 kilograms, if the weight was normal. Um, what about exercise? So this is something that, you know, in our culture, uh, women are told to lie down and rest in bed for the next nine months. And I think that is what creates the disasters of pregnancy, because this woman is being pampered, being fed, being treated like a royalty, and she's just getting fat in bed. And people think they're doing her a great service. She feels good too. She needs to get up, get moving, do her exercises, because it improves general well-being, pregnancy outcome, maternal mood, and maternal health. Aerobic exercises decrease blood glucose and reduces the delays, uh, reduces and delays the need for insulin. So if medical nutrition therapy and exercise are controlling, then you know your need for insulin may not arise or it may be delayed you know to, uh, to uh, and the eff effects of exercise last for more than 24 hours, less than 72. And uh, following aerobic exercise, uh, insulin sensitivity also improves. So insulin levels fall in type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes. The exercises that are to be avoided, all kinds of contact sports because you don't want her you know banging her belly somewhere. And you don't want a patient exercising supine in the first um, uh, after the first trimester because of the weight uh, pressure on the interior vena cava. And they should avoid motionless standing because that can lead to a syncope because all the blood gets pooled in that vasodilated state. And they should not be doing scuba diving because of the pressure changes. <clears throat> so uh, after intense exercise, there may be a little rise in blood sugar and that may be seen for up to two hours. So that can be uh, taken care of with various uh, dietary alterations. What are the benefits? Again, uh, a lot of benefits of exercise. I can go through this list, but um, decrease heart rate response to acute maternal exercise, increase amniotic fluid, increase in placental viability and volume, increase vascular function, faster placental growth, increase tolerance to labor, because obviously this is a fitter patient. So when a patient is fit, she can withstand labor, which is intense exercise. That's why it's called labor, I guess. So, you know, she's in a better condition to deal with that. Decrease risk of macrosomia, decrease risk of preterm birth, Increase neurodevelopmental and uh, 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 safety and lower body fat for the baby. Infants have increased uh, behavior, regulatory ability, and orientation. And there is also body fat benefits of exercise in, uh, at age five, even after delivery. And even things about language and intelligence are supposed to benefit when the mother is exercising during pregnancy. So a huge plus plus this business of exercise. And we don't tell our patients this. We are not a nation where their ex exercise culture has anything to do with anything. You know, so most people don't exercise. And for exercise, when you ask people, the first thing they say is treadmill lele. So my first answer to that is nahi bilkul nahi lele, us pe aap towel sukhayenge. So exercise jo hai, wo agar aapke paas bahar koi grounds nahi hai, koi jaga nahi hai, jahan aap exercise kare. आप अपने कमरे के अंदर एक एक रूटीन ऑफ एरोबिक एक्सरसाइजेस कर सकते हैं इंटरनेट पे पता नहीं कितने कितने किस्म की एरोबिक एक्सरसाइजेस की ड्रिल्स मौजूद हैं लोग फोन पे अलाबला देख रहे होते हैं यू नो टिकटॉक देखने के बजाय वो कोई एक लगाएं और उसके साथ एक्सरसाइज करें इट बी सो गुड फॉर यू सो it um, there are other benefits you know the pelvic floor exercises in addition to aerobic exercises you need to do some resistance exercises as well and they have all their other benefits as well uh, and in terms of the fasting uh, in effects on the uh, glucose uh, so there are these are some of the exercise guidelines that are not very different from the usual exercise guidelines which is 30 minutes of aerobic exercise a day um, uh, and not more than two days break at a time. 
and combined with uh, and you know moderate level level uh, intensity exercise which is swimming cycling running walking whatever you want to do and uh, some resistance drills so these resistance bills can just be a resistance band or uh, pregnancy uh, pilates you know the set of exercises which where, where you're using your own body weight it's also called calisthenics where your body weight is being used as a resistance so you throw in some sessions of that and uh, and that should be good for you um, very important components of managing diabetes or gdm exercise and medical nutrition therapy and uh, so on so let's now go, move on to what we do best, which is the pharmacological treatment of uh, pregnancy. What I'm showing you here is again, tables that you could look at, you know, uh, uh, this is again a safe ease table. And this is the first and third trimester guideline. And they're giving you ranges of fasting glucose and two hour postprandial glucose to decide your action. So, I don't have the time to go through these numbers, but NPT is non-pharmacological treatment. And when you do non-pharmacological treatment with these kind of sugars, 92 to 109 or more than 120 to uh, postprandial or less than 140, then after a week you recheck again and if treatment goals are not achieved, then you start pharmacological treatment as well. Okay, so you don't like normally when we're seeing a patient, we give them three months. Here you don't have three months to give. The baby is developing. So you need to be quick with whatever you're doing. So if targets are not achieved with counseling, with medical nutrition therapy exercise and everything, then you just monitor for a week and then escalate treatment. And, you know, for other, you monitor for one, uh, for, you know, if the sugars are higher, you monitor for just for three days. And if you're not getting to a target, you, uh, you start the pharmacological treatment. But if the fasting sugar is more than 126, which is the diagnostic level for non-pregnant states. And if the two hour postprandial is more than 200, straight away you need to go into pharmacological treatment. Um, in the third trimester, again, uh, the, uh, most of the time you have to do both because remember third trimester is the period of uh, maximum insulin resistance. So if you have these kind of sugars, you have to, again, you know, give yourself a week for a lesser levels of sugar and see if you can control it. And then uh, if not, then for these kind of levels, you straight away start treating. So uh, these are the, these are uh, tables that you need to look at, but the gist of the whole message is that if there is a very slight derangement of glucose, whether it's postprandial or fasting, then you can start a week of diet control and uh, exercise. And if you're meeting target by that time, fine. If you're not, then escalate treatment to some form of pharmacological treatment. So medications should be added in that case. And when insulin is the first line of agent. So if Vojo levels are more than 126 fasting and more than 200 random, at that level, you are just going to jump in with, I think if it's the first trimester, you're going to just jump in with, in, with insulin, probably. You can even withdraw it once the hyperglycemia is settled. If it's late third trimester, you may try uh, oral agents because by that time, organogenesis, baby has developed, you're just trying to reduce the macrosomia and so on. Uh, and you can you know, see for a week how things are working. But insulin is the main agent for uh, any substantial degree of uh, uh, dysglycemia. Metformin and glybenclamide are not recommended as first-line treatment for GDM. And, uh, uh, and this is obstetrics and gynecology data from abroad. In our case, with you know, it's so difficult to prescribe insulin to a remote patient, to an illiterate patient, that we may often be doing this, glybenclamide and uh, metformin and often we can get uh, to our targets with that also. So two randomized controlled trials of glibenclamide and metformin failed to provide adequate glycemic control in 23% and 25 to 20. So about a quarter of the patients with metformin and glibenclamide will not be controlled. So you will not be at target. And if you're not at target, you know, the damage is being done. So you have to remember that. Um, 
what about uh, glibenclamide? That's the only sulfonyl urea that is approved, can be used. The problem with them is they cross the placenta. And because they cross the placenta, they affect the fetal system as well. So there is increased chance of neonatal hypoglycemia. And uh, glibenclamide levels in the umbilical cord is approximately 70% of uh, maternal levels. So a lot of placental crossing. And the long-term safety data in terms of what happens to the offspring is lacking. You know, with metformin having been used for decades, or it is only recently in the last two or three years that we're beginning to learn about what is the effect on the baby where metformin is being taken by the mother. But with sulfonyl urea, this is kind of more recent uh, use. And here we have no idea. <clears throat> So what about metformin? Again, this also crosses the placenta. Uh, there's a lower risk of neonatal hypoglycemia for the reasons that we know and macrosomia, less maternal weight gain versus insulin. Insulin causes weight gain. Metformin may not cause weight loss, but it kind of holds the weight mostly. And uh, it may increase the risk of premature uh, prematurity slightly. This is a confusing issue because if you look at the what is published, it is even um, uh, uh, there are trials that report that, you know, premature delivery is less if the patient is on metformin. And here we have another conclusion with a set of uh, 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 papers that are published. So because it affects a diverse range of mitochondrial, hepatic and metabolic signaling pathways, this is why, you know, we and it is crossing the placenta. This is why there was this worry. What does it really do to the baby? You know, because it's affecting the baby just as it is affecting the mother. And we're just about beginning to learn something about it. So again, long-term programming, we don't know exactly, but we know some of the effects of this uh, thing with metformin. So in two randomized controlled trials of metformin in PCOS, so this is not GDM, this is PCOS. Often this category of patients are on metformin and they continue it. That was the practice during pregnancy. Follow-up of four-year-old offsprings has shown increased BMI and obesity in the offspring exposed to metformin, even in the setting of PCOS. And further study of long-term outcomes in the offspring is needed. In a randomized controlled trial of a large number of women, 751 women, children at two years of age, Again, increased fat stored in the subcutaneous tissues, larger upper arm circumference and subscapular skin folds. And there is maybe a lower amount of visceral body fat, but we don't know. So metformin in GDM, um, this is the MIG tofu study here, slightly older um, children, seven to nine years, offspring of mothers exposed to metformin for the treatment of GDM. And here again, larger than those exposed to insulin. They were comparing metformin versus insulin. So there is multiple randomized control trials which are now telling us that the babies tend to be fatter in women who are given metformin, whether it's PCOS, or whether it's GDM. So something is happening to their programming during the intrauterine life. Um, there's no evidence-based need to continue metformin in PCOS once pregnancy has been confirmed. So up till now, the practice was carry on taking it from previous, uh, you know, large trials. But now the randomized control trials are telling us that there is no need to do that. Um, uh, randomized control trials comparing metformin with other therapies for ovulation induction in women with PCOS have not demonstrated benefit in preventing spontaneous abortion or GDM. So it's, it's the same, you know, it's not doing. These were the reasons why it was continued in the scavenge rate come hojaiga and all of those things. So metformin from first trimester of delivery in PCOS may reduce the rate of miscarriage. Ye pehle tha, jo ke publish hua hai. Abhi bhi is tarah ki publications hai. Or preterm delivery. And this is the reference to the, these uh, conclusions. But this is what is now emerging. Um, it has no effects on GDM prevalence though. So just because you're taking metformin, it does not protect you from not having GDM later on in pregnancy. And it, it has no effect in decreasing preeclampsia. What about insulin? 
the the good thing about insulin is it does not cross the placenta so baby is kind of doing his own thing and the mother's glucose will influence the baby's beta cells but not the insulin that is going into the mother so uh, insulin is the preferred agent for type 1 and type 2 diabetes and gdn um usually uh, type 2 diabetes jinko pehle se not gdn may recognize well ye type 2 diabetes jo hai ye uh, this is uh, something that will probably not respond to anything during pregnancy so they have been existed they will need insulin uh, to transition to insulin and uh, both uh, multiple daily injections and continuous subcutaneous, subcutaneous insulin infu infusion are reasonable uh, treatment strategies agar aap insulin de rahe hain so in countries where pumps are the norm women can continue to use their pump pumps during pregnancy and neither has been shown to be superior than the other what about the management of pre existing type 1 and type 2 diabetes let's just focus on this a little bit i alluded to it a little while ago so early in the first trimester increase in insulin is needed because you know the stress and everything has come in and and the placental hormones and after that by about 9 to 16 weeks you may need to reduce the insulin a little um and this is the kind of pattern so initial 9 weeks increase in insulin requirement 9 to 16 weeks a little decrease and roughly a doubling of insulin requirement by the third trimester because that is the time of most insulin resistance and as so, and uh, somehow usually the pattern of distribution we use for uh, uh, insulin in any patient is 50% basal and 50% uh, prandial here they seem to lead, need a little less basal insulin and a little more prandial insulin so we need a team based care here and unfortunately um hamare ye mumkin nahi hai so you you need a maternal fetal medicine specialist remember the baby has to be monitored all the time you know that and there are very nice ways of now monitoring the baby the biophysical profile the, the non stress testing the ctg jo aap log karte hain the fetal heart rate and so on and the five parameters that are used in the biophysical profile of the baby which is started you start doing it by about 32 weeks and it has a total score of 10 so between 8 and 10 is probably all right anything below 10 is uh, thing and that takes into account the amniotic fluid volume the the patient the baby's uh, movements the baby's uh, heart rate the baby's uh, breathing pattern and uh, one more there are four baby factors but anyway these are things that not, that are not within the scope of a, physicians work but i'm sure the uh, obstetricians deal with it all the time so um <clears throat> so none of the currently available insulin preparations cro uh, cross the placenta and aap agar insulin ko padhe to unme sab pe ye likha hota hai ki chand ek license hai aur baki sab pe hota hai ki use if you are if you feel that you need to use it सो जो पुरानी इंसुलेंस हैं रेगुलर इंसुलेंस में तो कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है बट एनालॉग इंसुलेंस में भी बायल लार्ज कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है जो आपकी इंसुलिन ग्लार्जीन है लेंटस जो है वो उसका ग्रोथ पोटेंशियल कहीं ज्यादा है and has not been advocated so see how your patient is doing see if they need three prandial injections two prandial injections one basal injection you know you have to see how your patient is is working so preeclampsia you know is again new onset hypertension at 20 weeks along with proteinuria the gynecologists and obstetricians know more about this um but diabetes i've said it again and again associated with an increased uh, risk of that and low dose aspirin um, started after the first trimester may kind of help with that situation um management of pre existing diabetes um risk of hypo in the first trimester and an altered counter regulatory response in uh, pregnancy so hypoglycemia awareness become hoti hai 
सो रिस्क ऑफ हाइपो भी है ज्यादा और अवेयरनेस भी कम होती है सो यू हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल एंड वेन द इंसुलिन रेजिस्टेंस ड्रॉप्स एज सुन एज द प्लेसेंटा इज डिलीवर्ड दैट इज अ क्रूशल टाइम फॉर हाइपो सो यू हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल विद द इंसुलिन दैट इज गोइंग एट दैट टाइम एंड pregnancy is a ketogenic state so very quickly missing insulin patient may slip into ketoacidosis at a much lower lower level of glucose so it's a euglycemic kind of ketoacidosis normally when we see ketoacidosis it is a sugar of more than 250 mg but here at a lower level you will have uh, uh, this um and you need to monitor the ketones if, especially if the labor is prolonged and dka prevention is um so if you start with very tight diabetes control very quickly it may make the retinopathy worse so if there isn't a need to you know ek do din mein control karne ki perhaps it's better to try and control it over a week 10 days because so that you don't if you know that there's bad retinopathy on board um cgm is the thing current thing or ab yahan pe real time cgm available ho gaya freestyle libre you wear a little device on your subcutaneous tissue in the arm one device sits there like jaise aap ecg ka monitor chipkate hain usi tarah ki cheez hoti hai you can bathe with it and everything do everything you want with it and it is you take a reader you or your cell phones and take it on top of that uh, device the the sensor and you will get a, a blood sugar reading so it's a very convenient thing to know and it, and that also gives you the trend ki sugar zyada ja rahi hai ya kam ho rahi hai and hypo ka risk kya hai so patients feel very secure with this device so the cost is about 20000 rupees a month so uh, cgm use in pregnancy uh, in type 1 diabetes improved neonatal outcome is uh, an evolving area of knowledge the more knowledgeable the doctors and the nurses who manage diabetes get about it and the patients basically are you know told about it the better it's going to get um glycemic control is often easier to achieve in type 2 diabetes than type 1 diabetes they require much higher doses of insulin and insulin requirements i've already told you drops rapidly after delivery and all the associated things have to be managed like hypertension and so on um um pregnancy loss is more prevalent in the third trimester and in type 2 diabetes versus type 1 diabetes what about self monitoring of glucose this is very very important and uh, a minimum of 4 is what you need unless the control is excellent and just on diet and exercise but anyone who is taking insulin a minimum of 4 is what you need. so bahut sare protocols but different use karte hain so one is uh, pre meal and one or two are after a meal i often prefer the one hour after a meal glucose because that's the highest and we want to catch the highest so instead of telling pregnant women to do the two hour one we should tell them to do a one hour sugar so pre meal and a one hour uh, after meal sugar so fasting and uh, one hour after meal and uh, daily monitoring is far less super, uh, more superior and these are you know all evidence based guidelines after achieving target you can reduce the, especially agar oral pe hain to monitoring aap reduce kar sakte hain agar insulin pe hain to ek nocturnal bedtime karna chahiye to make sure that you know hypo ki awareness bhi kam hoti hai to we uh, check that so bahut sare different regimes hain intensive six times a day for each meal two hours after this is when you're trying to find control it is three to four times that i've described to you and a modify is four to five times daily or alternate day aap ek din skip kar de ek din kar de as a representative of what is going on so many different things can be tried medical nutrition therapy for men you know you could do less uh, less uh, testing so just a little bit uh, i'm coming to my end um 
it, there is, it, uh, you know, don't forget about their diabetes once they're in labor. Okay? You know, the pregnancy is over, she's about to deliver. The, this is a crucial time as well. So, and often when patients are on insulin and they're admitted for delivery, then, you know, sabke haat pair pool jate hain hospital mein, aapko phone aane shuru hote hain. Insulin ka kya karna hai? So, agar subah severi, to usually the induction should happen in the morning. Taake aapke zyada controlled so night before, no real changes are required. Everything happens like normally. If you have a induction in the night, then you don't have a patient to dinner. So whatever you want to do, do it that way. If you have a insulin dose high or long-acting insulin, you are taking it in the night. If you are taking it in the morning, it's the dose. If you are taking it in the morning, but if you are intermediate acting insulin, two doses, regular insulin, intermediate acting, then you are may want to reduce it because especially on un, un, un insulin a peak hota hai, halfway through the dose us peak pe wo npo hogi so wo peak ko aapne reduce karna hai. so you may want to reduce that um morning of in, in the, uh, induction agar ye intermediate acting pe hai to you know you she still needs her basal insulin so you can give half the dose of the morning uh, basal insulin in other words, what we are saying is basal insulin chalta rega. You don't need to stop the basal insulin. You may need to reduce the dose, but don't stop it. And uh, uh, so, and what should the, this is very important. Because in intrapartum period, if there is hyperglycemia, then what will happen? I, I'm not talking about ketosis level of uh, because strictly speaking, NPO to nahi hoti hai na. They are eating, uh, you know, light whatever meals or drinking something. So, uh, kya hoga? Why do we want the thing to be good control at this point? It's not the mother so much as the baby, because. Baby will because insulin to cross nahi kar rahi hai. but mother ka sugar to baby pe reflect kar rahe to uska pancreas bought insulin banayega baby ka. So after delivery, the baby is sitting with a high insulin level, and you know that hypoglycemia may be uh, may be problematic. So you need to go go there. So I'm not going to discuss this table with you, but again, it it would be uh, in your moments of leisure if you have any. You can sit with this uh, thing and the, the gist of thing is that you could do as intravenous insulin, you know, very small doses, depending on what the sugar is. Test uh, the, uh, put up an infusion if your patient is not eating uh, eating anything particularly, a 5% dextrose in half strength saline, will continue to check, if uh, there is prolonged labor, to ketones, rule check kare. And at levels of more than 200 or 4 units per hour, pe intravenous insulin shuru karte. He can check every two hours and, you know, in, adjust accordingly, go down and up. So some, and you can give small doses. Analogs insulin, they're easier to use. Because absorption is rapid, their duration of action is short. So on small doses, subcutaneous frequently, we can if we're checking the sugar uh, closely. So um, postpartum glycemic management. This is again important. We can't forget that this patient ko abhi hum treat kar rahe the with uh, everything. So you instantly decrease the intensity of monitoring. Uh, if they are on metformin alone, stop it. Uh, if, on, if they're on low dose of insulin, so lot less than 0.5 units per kilogram per day, stop insulin. Okay, and just monitor glucose. Um, agar pre agar just, ye gestational diabetes hai. so for the first time agar pre gestational diabetes hai, pehle se pata tha, on insulin which is more than one unit per uh, kilogram per day so agar 50 kilograms hai, for instance or 50 units pure din mein le rahi hai, then you reduce the dose by 50 percent carry on with it because pehle se insulin le rahi hai. Pehle se, uh, wo diabetes thi. Agar ye, uh, 0 0.5 to 1 unit say again a low dose, you can stop or you can reduce and see how it goes. And we've talked about the insulin sensitivity and then it picks up, uh, uh, drop, okay, 
सो अगर आपने कैलकुलेट ही करना है तो यू कैन यूज द पॉइंट थ्री यूनिट फॉर्मूला ऑफ इंसुलिन पर किलोग्राम एंड अगर सीजेरियन सेक्शन हुआ है एन पी ओ होगी पेशेंट आपने ड्रिप शिप लगानी है फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द डोज आप देते रहे सो इन द पोस्ट पार्टम स्टेट यू नीड टू अगेन इवेल्युएट वॉट द डायबिटीज सिचुएशन इज सो इन आप लोगों का फर्स्ट पोस्ट पार्टम सिक्स वीक्स का होता है सो सिक्स वीक्स और ट्वेल्व वीक्स Re-evaluation with the seventy-five gram OGTT to know where this woman stands, and OGTT is better than HbA1c because your delivery, bleeding, ye wo se HbA1c वैसे ही unreliable होता है और HbA1c पे जो pregnancy के effects होते हैं increased red cell turnover के वो they they take at least six weeks to normalize so उससे पहले करने का कोई फायदा नहीं है so it, it's better to re-evaluate this patient with an OGTT. and uh, if because she had gdm she should be tested subsequently also because there's a 50% chance that in the next 5 to 10 years un ko diabetes ho jayega and again frequency of testing just depends on the patient's thing I've talked about this um this is the abcd efg it all of this we have more or less so the, all the things that we have if you especially if you develop gdm that brings us to the end i hope that i have taxed you too much um but it's very important because here we are treating two patients at the same time and you have to you know the stress of delivering a, a healthy mother at the end of 